Hello and welcome to Extreme Perspectives. This is a monthly podcast created by The Sense Network to bring you conversations with people who see things differently and think differently. This podcast is for people who want to expand their mind and develop their creative intelligence. I'm your host, Jeremy Brown. For 20 years, I've been seeking out people from the edges of culture, the creators, outliers, misfits, rebels, and the crazy ones, people who want to change things and push the human race forward. In this episode of Extreme Perspectives, I speak with the misfit, columnist, post-post-punk, and believer in the power of play, Pat Kane. Pat is an 80s musician who used his platform to subtly introduce chart listeners to counterculture, and more recently to create a new festival for fellow misfits. Join us as we discuss the importance of play in a DIY culture and why we must embrace the positive potential of AI rather than defaulting to a position of fear. Hi, Pat. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm very well. I'm delighted that we've been able to carve out some time today. The thing I'm most concerned about, though, is are we going to have sufficient time? Because I know how wide ranging our conversations can be. Yes, indeed. Fueled by fueled by intense coffee, so let's go. Very good. Well, uh, if you're familiar with the Extreme Perspectives podcast, you know that with all my guests, I start with the same question. So, as I say, hello, Pat Kane. Are you, or would you describe yourself as an outlier, misfit, rebel, or a crazy one? These are really great options because they all interestingly overlap, and I'm sure many of your guests say, "Can I pick three from four? But I'm 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 going to go with my gut and say misfit, and I think misfit I like because I'm quite interested in um, innovative organisations. As maybe it's because I've been in a band for years, I've worked on editorial floors, you know. But I sort of I really I really like uh, quirky teams of people getting stuff done. Um, I think it's I think it's great if you can manage it. So a misfit is someone who is not very happy with the organisational situation that they're in and goes and creates a new one or figures out new ways to find other misfits so that they can quirkily hang together and, and get great things achieved. So I'll go for misfit. I think that's a great choice. And I also think it's a great cornerstone for us to build this conversation on. It's, a, I think, a very nice segue to where I think we, we, we might end up because I, I think just just to this is not our first conversation. I think just for those those listening, I think this conversation, I mean, dare I say it, it may have been over twenty years ago. It first started. I think when you published the play ethic, um, and it's been a fascinating commentary ever since. But I'd love to hear just a little bit more about your creative journey, Pat. You've touched on a few things, um, making music. Uh, journalist, author, um, but it would just be great if we could just set some context a little bit for the creative journey that you've been on. Sure. Well, it's interesting. I wrote a column the other day dwelling on the way that Elon Musk behaves on Twitter, that kind of cheeky, playful, irreverent way that he behaves and the kind of justifications that he's making for Twitter as a zone of free speech. And I suddenly realised that at the age of 16, I was creating satirical photocopied stapled together magazines in my school lunchtime and distributing them about the yard. So I've been I've been trying to kind of make spiky media for almost as long as I can remember. Um, and then, of course, I was a post post punk, which is just after post punk. And so the whole idea of of DIY aesthetics, but also very high quality art and technique. Uh, was was the legacy of punk and post punk? You know, you could, you could be rebellious, you could be a misfit, but you could also sound like the Temptations or Miles Davis. So, I had that experience. I came into the music business um, in 1987, at the peak 1987 to 1991, having done a classic postmodern media studies literary theory education. So I was I was full of it. I was on stage in my gold tee suits dancing around like a pretty thing but also thinking how can I sneak this interesting metaphor into a chorus that gets to number five in the charts and so I managed it a few times so certainly from the kind of the the, early, the late 80s to the early 90s on I was I was semiotically full of myself I thought anything 
I can be involved in anything. I can throw any shape. I can be involved in any media that arises. And so, and so that was, a, so the CompuServe account in, <clears throat> in 1993 was a kind of crucial moment. And I, I, remember, I remember finding a bookshop that I'd visited in New York when recording on a Mosaic browser and immediately having a, a head meltdown because I thought this is, a, this is a technology which makes me a global person sitting in Glasgow with, with my device. And that's definitely reverberated um, all the way through to my own preoccupations in the present. Um, but it also helped me. The other thing that was great about my creative journey though, was that my mum forced me to become a 10-finger touch typist which meant that I could move from holding a microphone to pummeling out a keyboard and media careers quite easily. So I became a journalist, broadcaster, won Sony Awards, um, started up a newspaper in 1999 called The Sunday Herald in Scotland, and then left that newspaper because I didn't like the way that the bureaucrats were counting my keystrokes on my keyboard, um, which I discovered that they were doing to measure my productivity. So I flounced off in a, in a huff and wrote a book called The Play Ethic in 2004, which was a, inspired by an essay I wrote in 2000 for the, for the Observer newspaper. And that's probably when we started to meet up, uh, Jeremy, because I kind of announced the idea of the play ethic to the wider world, and we can obviously talk about that. But that's kind of fueled me right up to the present, uh, which is a kind of an interest, a deep interest in creativity, not just as it feeds into innovation and business, but also into society, into politics, into philosophy, into science. It's become a major obsession of mine. But that's probably the point where we clicked up, yeah? Yeah, I defi- it, it certainly was when dial-up was just coming on. I think we may have, uh, at Sense Worldwide, just placed the first router in a lunchbox over a street and created one of the first free Wi-Fi hubs in London at that point. And we were sort of wall chalking on the walls to let those people who could read the semiotic codes that there would be free internet access at this point. So, yeah, I, and, uh, well, you're an early blogger as well. So there was, I think, very few people with blogs... Uh, let alone business blogs, and I think we, I think we were being written about by the Guardian as well as as having one of the first uh, blogs in the business world. Which was, uh, when you look back at it now, it's um, we've come a long way, baby. It's funny we we have come a long way, but it's funny that the the latest iteration of the web is actually trying to bring the blog back, but to connect it to a paying audience. So it's as if we've gone through this kind of roller coaster of the web, which kind of decommodified everything, threw it all out for for free use, for remix and cut and copy, uh, and we're now back in a situation which I remember the original internet being against, which was that every click was a transaction. Well, we're kind of back. We're almost in a situation where we've gone through our learning curve and we're trying to sift out the the, the best of the old model, the best of the new model. So it's interesting, I, I, and I think I don't think we even begin to reckon with the revolutionary fact that everybody is a publisher from the from the bus stop to News Corp, and I think that's a, that that plus considerations of creativity keeps reminding us that we are never going back to Kansas anymore. Well, you call it Kansas. I always love to think about it as the Wild West, and I still like those parts of the web where it is still the Wild West, uh, and I guess, but that outlook uh, has has never left me and so as we saw the aggregation and the disaggregation and now the re-aggregation of this content I think yeah we're, we're sort of watching these cycles play out but what I think you used the term earlier DIY and I think that DIY culture for me you talk about the fanzines I remember picking up copies of uh, Sniffing Glue which was sort of that cut and paste John Ball printing set style aesthetic for the punk fanzines and always looking at that. And that was a sort of generation before me. My DIY culture was more around the, the whole acid house and, and rave scene. And, but I think there was a certain ethos there that remains this day and has been present sort of in that counterculture as you go through and every generation, it sort of plays out in a slightly different way. But I think with the idea of DIY, it's just about getting up and doing stuff. And it's sort of that test and learn. And and I think that for me is really, a, it's a very human thing. It is that sort of 
idea of just raw creativity, just raw expression. And then over time, well, hopefully you'll find your feet and you'll find your market. And, you know, so all of those things that is in that sort of startup sort of lexicon, actually, I think has its roots in that sort of culture. You were making a magazine and that magazine then finds its audience. And I think, you know, that for me is one of the best ways to learn. But I think there's just not enough of that or it's hidden somehow and you know and it and it almost gets clouded you know how far do we need to go to to find that rawness and that that wild west that's out there that's that's out there still um and i think that for me is you know as we look at the outliers or the misfits or the rebels or crazy ones you know so much of that how easy is it now to go and find find that stuff what would you say are the are the the, the, the sort of the fanzines today which ones would you look to or you know do they exist or what forms do they take i'd like to answer that question by thinking about the nature and the biology of play and what are the circumstances in which playfulness which which would which is what is fueling diy culture joyful making culture what are the things that sustain it and i want to jump across maybe this is like a 40 year gap between the way that um, the enterprise allowance scheme in the 70s and the late 70s and the, and the early 80s and the late 80s supported musicians to just do what it was almost like the state turning a blind eye to subsidy. As long as you reported that you were doing something at the end of three months, it would be fine. But what that was actually supporting was a whole equal culture of music and music makers. Jump forward to the present and, uh, and look at the way that SoundCloud is operating in relationship to musical genres it's absolutely fascinating my my stepson is a guy called naughty step and he is a video blogger of something called deep bass but mo most of his uh, curation comes from an audience that's also um to a great degree makers of music to a great degree supporters of the music and they're all on soundcloud um if they make money they make money from playing gigs but what they're doing on SoundCloud is just using this platform in the same way as a platform was used in the Enterprise Allowance Scheme, the welfare scheme in, in the mid to late 80s uh, and they're, they're standing on a ground of play I call it. So the question is what uh, what are, what is the seniors as Brian Eno would, would call it, what is the platform, what is the ground of play that can allow people to take risks without them becoming fatally injurious. You know you take that's one of the great things why I'm interested in play is because it gives us a way to think about a culture of risk and to some degree there has to be either an inner or an outer security you can do it from an inner security I mean I think you can you can take the right cocktail of drugs you can have the right background you can have, be part of the right identity and you can be fearless in that way you can also be helped to be like that and it's interesting as, as a musician and I look at Spotify and one half of me thinks you're ripping me off. The other half of me thinks, my God, I've now got the universal jukebox. So at one level, it's a commercial operation, but at another level, it's the biggest musical Lego box that there's ever been. And you can find anything you want on this bold platform. So that's what I would I would say. Not I mean, one could look at. I mean, one could look at you know the NFTs, or one could look at the repair culture uh, that's coming along. The right to repair. People looking at objects like uh, Apple Apple phones that they can't fix and, and co coordinating themselves to figure out how to repair these things. You could look at that, but they're all reliant on wet, beautifully constructed platforms to support people's risk taking, playful, adventuring. And I think that's I think that's the bit that's not often thought about when we th when we think about to encourage creative play and risk is that is that you can design a platform that lets it flourish you can design a platform that doesn't and I think that's a crucial factor one of the projects that we haven't talked about yet that I know uh, that you've been heavily involved in because you designed the r d process is for the unboxed festival and I think that's fascinating because I think that that touches on some of the things that you've been talking about. It's just about creating that space uh, for collaboration and ideas to emerge. And for those people that haven't had the benefit or know what Unbox is about, it would be great just to say a little bit about that and, and, and what you've been up to on that project. Well, it's got a spiky history, it has to be said, Jeremy. It's actually, it was originally, and it wasn't officially called this, but this is what it was described as, the festival of Brexit. So the money was, 
the money was devoted by, I think, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg and Theresa May to be some kind of spirit-raising exercise after the endeavours and efforts of Brexit. Um, it, that was taken over by the people who did the original Olympic ceremony in 2012, which everybody was completely surprised by. So the team took that over and they said, let's steer this towards a collective celebration of creativity per se. Let's not tie it to anything patriotic. Let's have no flags involved. In fact, I don't think there's one Union Jack in any of the promotional literature. Uh, and let's figure out, let's call it something, but let's call it unboxed. So it's it's gone from being a festival of Brexit to the latest tabloid description of it, a festival of bonkers. And the reason why they call it a festival of bonkers is because we set up a situation, I helped to design a situation in which, you know, the arts and the sciences, you know, technology and dance, um, you know, astrophysics and metaphysics could have a conversation and be in the same place. And we did this in in, at the, in the teeth of COVID uh, and the, the heart of lockdown. So we had to sort of bring together um, 30 projects. We had to bring them into a, a creative online space. We gave them you know, master classes from various world experts, you know, people David Olusoga and uh, Malcolm Gladwell and uh, Nadia from Pussy Riot brought them to these uh, these um, teams, cross disciplinary teams, and we basically created what, what you could call a creative commons in which there was um, this possibility to create ideas, to be inspired by big ideas, to have random meetups and conversations, and we had to try and create the, the vibe of a great conference, of a great workshop online. And, you know, it worked. Well, we came up with 10 final um, projects, which I'm, and we're all incredibly proud of. Probably the, proud, the one we're proudest of is a thing called uh, Dream Machine, which is a public free psychedelic light and sound experience, which is literally blowing people's minds in an entirely safe and non-invasive way. So that's number one. The second one I love is a thing called Sea Monster, where they're going to take a giant discarded oil rig and place it on the sands of Western Supermare to make a point about shifting from fossil fuels to renewable, but also to make it a wonderful creative carnival space. And the point is that these people were liberated across disciplines, across arts and sciences and commerce and high art, to create these things because we created, as I as I keep saying, a ground of play, a creative commons in which the boundaries could be crossed, in which ideas could be chased across disciplines. It's I'm something I'm really proud of and what we hope that it's going to do is to sort of raise the tide of everyday creativity on these islands after it finishes. So the thing I'm working on is what's the kind of teaching method legacy from creating these kind of projects but but from festival of brexit to festival of bonkers i think it's quite a good end quite a good end point i love that and all those different worlds and, and you know as we like to say when worlds collide that transformation happens because it is a, a, a just a it, well it's just a it's a beautiful thing when it happens so it's it's great to see that in practice but to pick up you were just saying about being able to sort of rise the the tide, if you like, of of, of creativity, and that's something that's very important um, to us as an organisation, and sure. particularly for the Sense Network, the the idea of creative intelligence. So, how can we understand, interpret, and act with imagination? And certainly in the age of artificial intelligence, machine learning. You know, this is what is going to keep us humans competitive. It's what we can, I have to eat my words one day, maybe, but it's what we can do uniquely as human beings is to just make those creative leaps, to spot the patterns that, you know, there isn't sufficient information for a machine to spot that pattern yet. And we can make those connections and join those dots and make those creative leaps. Um, and this is why I feel that it's, it's well, it's just missing from our curriculum. I just don't think it's in education. In fact, I think it, creativity is educated out of us. And so I think when you have your rallying cry for play and the role of play, because we know that play then leads to creativity and creativity leads to innovation. So there's a, you know, there's a very valuable sort of output to this, but you can't start off by saying it's sort of this is a really valuable exercise because sometimes it's just a blind alley you know it's just some fun and it literally is playing but those play in itself is just 
well, um, you're as a as a theorist, you're much much more sort of on the ball with everything that underpins this. But it is just that sort of that that casual play or that you know that's the beginning, right? And that need more of that needs to be encouraged. Yeah, totally. But it's I think we're in, we're moving into very unprecedented times on this. I mean, th- I'll tell you the basic the basic sort of informed theory of play that I have is it's it's a rehearsal for living with other complex creatures like our fellow humans. So that's what play has been in the mammalian condition, never mind the human condition, up till now. It's a sort of it's a chance to to be as if as if we're going to do something. And often if you look at uh, adult play and child play, you know, whether it's you know Netflix or the playground, we are rehearsing the difficulties of being with other people so that we can maybe get it right in practice. Uh, and that's 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 a great argument for better education systems. That's a great argument. It's probably what sits behind the great resignation, you know, where people are after COVID are thinking, what is what is the point of doing what I'm doing if I don't believe in it, if I don't like it? So there's there's it's it's not a small matter to stay apart from the work ethic and go towards a play ethic. I think it's having big uh, consequences reading in the Financial Times this morning about how people are and just don't want to come back to work. Why would that be? Good, interesting question. So, but what's happening, Jeremy, and I think we'll have to get ready for this in the next couple of years, is that play is a is not just is not just a kind of rehearsal for life. It's becoming the practice of life, and I think we see that from the amount of people that are playing video games who are completely shaped in the way that they think about the world. They think about the world as a set of rule sets or they think about the world as a world that they can create or inhabit. Um, And I think the the relationship between imagination and action is becoming very, very close. And that's that's a really powerful, both dark and light perspective. Um, You know, we have to really, if we're looking at the the graphs that gives us the kind of ski slope, the vertical ski slope downwards between 2020 and 2050 in terms of resource use, I mean, that's a crazy ride. And we're going to have to be powerfully imaginative to get down those slopes where we reduce material throughput and we reduce carbon use. We're going to have, it, it could be terrifying, but it could also be incredibly thrilling and exciting. So there's a, there's a real requirement for people to be able to spin possibilities in their head but because they're going to have to put them into reality pretty quickly we're going to have to radically revise what we think of as a lifestyle to be able to cope with this this ecological um, frontier but to add to that uh, you'll probably know and you'll be aware that the, the leading edge of AI uh, which is the Google's deep mind subs- subsidiary basically creates advances in artificial intelligence by people, by these entities playing games. I mean, there's almost no board game in existence that a computer can't thrash uh, the human with. We just had uh, DALL-E 2, which is a, which is another massive image, image processing where you basically write in your requirement for, a, for a, a, an image and it, and it produces it to quite to extremely high level of uh, accuracy and even creativity. So one of the things I think that's coming along with play is that we're going to have to be able to play with these smart machines. And there's a brilliant guy called Mo Godat, the ex-Google guy, who says, if we're bringing these, if these are new children coming into our civilization, what are we teaching them to do? We're teaching them to gamble. We're teaching them to survey and spy on us. We're teaching them, you know, to exploit and extract. You know, so play, yes, is... To some degree, at the moment, uniquely human, I think it's we're going to be in a in a creative relationship with other players in our universe pretty soon, and it's the exponential curve of AI is is incredible, um, and I'm not saying we're we're getting to Robbie the robot within the next five years, but I think within the next 10, 15 years, we're going to be with entities that will have to figure out how we relate to them. The chess players have already got it sorted out. They they play they play what they call centaur chess. Yes. So a centaur is a half human and a half machine or a half animal. So they're already having these machines by their side, letting them make their crazy moves and go and chess and saying, okay, well, how can I respond to that intuitively with all the unpredictability of the human mind? How can I build on their disciplined randomness uh, to make even better moves? So they're partners now. So, so the AI and the chess player or the Go player are partners in creative play. That's another frontier that actually playfulness, when you think about it, which is this kind of 
str strange imaginative capacity that's evolved out of necessity. I mean, this idea of projecting realities as a way of surviving, which humans do best of all. We're now going to be doing that with the, with the products of our own invention. And I think it's interesting... Um, you know, I, I think I think we're getting used to that by the way that our retail experiences say, if you like this, you might like that. The, the way that we're, our data is being analysed and we're being anticipated, I think has been training us to be involved in a world where we will be with other artificial entities. And I think if, we, if we're if we freaked out by that, if we think, if we raise the Luddite cry to smash the looms, the looms as they did in the 17th, 18th century, it will go badly. But if we think of them as brilliant children that we're going to grow up with and pro program and input into a way that they will be making beautiful stuff alongside with us, that 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 playful attitude might be might get us uh, help our robot overlords be be good to us, you know. But that's that's the mantra that we live by as well. Is it's. How can we let humans do what they do best and let technology take care of the rest? And it's and it's like, how can we just keep focusing in on, I hate to say it, the sort of the, the use value of the human, if you like. It's like, how do we start yeah. to move into really understanding, you know, and that's it's also very fulfilling at, on an individual basis as well. I think these are the other sort of of just the act of creation. I mean, I've been drawing parallels over the years with why is cooking taken off? Well, you know, in an era of, you know, just where you don't get instant gratification, cooking is one of those acts where you can take raw ingredients and within the space of maybe an hour or two, even less, but, you know, create something, serve it up and get some positive feedback from people. You know, it's like, actually, as a creative act, that's a wonderful thing. And it's good for all sorts of things, whether it's mental health or whatever it might be just you know it's just good stuff making stuff as opposed to doom scrolling which is sort of the other end of the spectrum and you know and it's when you when you go back when I over the years you're sort of thinking well what are the things that have stopped creativity coming through was it was it consumer credit did it just make it easy to acquire stuff so you didn't have to go out and sort of work for it was it 24 hour MTV you've you're you've just got creative images images washing over you every day so just by default because you're watching the picture you think you're being creative but you're not being creative and I think that that's almost the lock as you talk about sort of the dark and the light of technology and whether that's addiction or gambling and you know the sort of the manipulation and what was it the, the militarization militarization as well yeah exactly exactly and I think this is where it starts to get exciting is why how can we start to classify things for what they are um, and, and start to get down to the root of like, well, what are the valuable acts and, and what are the things you can make a difference? But often you don't know what they are. It, as you say, it's, it starts, starts with play. No, but it's interesting. And I think there's a real deficit here on imagining the future in a way that isn't doom laden. I mean, it's an extraordinary deficit. Um, it's, and it's, it's, I struggle sometimes to imagine narratives or even adverts of the future that aren't dystopian. You know, the one that I think it was the Spike Jones movie, I think is either called She or Her, I can't remember, yes. but Scarlett Johansson is the AI and Joaquin Phoenix is the kind of entranced uh, pastel coloured information worker and what's it's a beautiful romance so it's it's a comedy romance you know imagine a science fiction comedy romance it's not easy to do so but there's there's a there's, a, there's also mind-blowing parts of it whereas at the end she says something like he says i thought you loved me she says yes but i love 3725 other people and in any case me and my artificial friends, we're going off somewhere, we're leaving, we're leaving this place and we're going to leave you behind and we do love you but we've outgrown this space and we're off to somewhere else. You know, that idea, and I think the final scene of that movie is uh, the four humans sitting on a hilltop drinking wine and cheese. But it, there's, it's, it's in poise, it's a conflict that's in poise, it's not Terminator 2, it's sort of an expanded universe. You know, and I think that's a I think that's a problem. There was another thing I, did, I picked up the other day, um, a, a yogurt company in New York called Chobani, and they did this amazing solar punk advert, uh, which was all about the kind of 
you know, sophisticated ways that artificial technology would combine with agriculture. It's beautiful manga, you know, Studio Ghibli kind of type animation. And a bunch of crazy anarchists took it, removed the soundtrack, put, replaced it with a soundtrack of birdsong. And every time a Chobani uh, article came out of the sky, they put on it with Photoshop commons or, or donation or purity, or whatever it was that they wanted to do. So they, they completely just re revised it, decommodified it, they called it. Chobani hasn't taken it down. Chobani clearly sees that as part of the discussion and story around about what it's trying to do with its vision of sustainability. So I think there's an awful lot of, um, and I think I think actually advertising culture has a lot of a, a role to play here in the way that it viscerally gets to people about how the future can be doable, uh, actionable, livable, and very much uh, relevant to our kind of general uh, dysphoria at the moment and our, our, our understandable anxiety about the way that things are going. But I think I think it's time for um, positive semi-utopian imagineers, you know, to kind of shout about the quality of that kind of vision as opposed to the classic press the buttons of fear, anger and panic, uh, which are there in our evolved human condition, but also in our evolved human condition is curiosity, play, care and lust also. So there's a, there's a, there is actually quite a different palette that we can be um, project, projecting and making our image culture too. And I'm really eclectic about where that comes from. That can come from an avant-garde student film project. It can come from a, a, a major company trying to redefine its brands. It can come from something like what we've, I've been doing with Unboxed, uh, which has a kind of state municipal impetus. I don't mind. We just need to raise the quality of our futuristic aspiration in the, in the mainstream of society as, as much as we can. So I know you like new terms, so I think I've got one for you to describe this. Poptimism. Okay, go. Poptimism. Optimism, I like it. Popular <laughs> optimism. Because there's, there's certainly like there's not enough of it. <laughs> and, uh, there's and not I, enough optimism. <laughs> and I think that, uh, I mean, any anything that can show pathways to the future which are positive. And I, I like to think that, you know, one of the tools that we use is just a simple reframe because we know how powerful nightmares are. And so whether that's pandemic or global warming um, and how those stories can be amplified, they don't really mo necessarily motivate to action. And I think positive messages can be equally as powerful but it's just more difficult to get there. It's sort of the lazy route that the uh, behavioral scientists use to sort of nudge us or actually bludgeon us um, at times, or certainly last couple of years into new, new behaviors. You know, as you think about new terms and sort of where we go with that, I think these are the ideas that actually can underpin those narratives and that storytelling. And I think storytelling, you know, more and more people talk about storytelling now and the power of storytelling, but it still is very superficial and you sort of, you hear it. No one's really, as you say, it doesn't matter where it comes from, because if it's a great story, it's going to get through and it's going to, it's going to rise up. But that, that for me is something that I certainly try and encourage everyone uh, in the studio and working on sense of what you know, how do we reframe this so you can actually get people energized and some enthusiasm? Because, you know, no one wants to work towards a, uh, a gloomy doom. No, no, sure. I mean, George Monbiot, the environmental campaigner, uh, made a point in a book a couple of years ago uh, that we are, we are, that there's a big story about restoration, you know, that we could easily tap into, you know, collectively. Um, you know, where uh, you've made a mistake, uh, you've gone down the wrong direction, and the pleasures of going in the right direction are deep and, prof and deep and profound. So we'll, I, I, think, I think the tricky thing, though, for, for environmentalists and campaigners in that respect is that they're relying on a relationship between democracy and changed government, which I don't think many of us can rely on at the moment. One of the things I'm involved with is a thing called the alternative uh, which is inspired by the Danish Alternative Party, and it, it sort of it sort of proceeds from the from the assumption from the fact that only two to five percent of uh, electorates 
are members of political parties. And so it's that culture that decides most of the policies that exist in any society. So it's, it's, it's a really pathetic number. That means there's 98 to 96% of people who who want a, a better world but are not spoken to by the ex by the people who are supposed to engineer that better world to some degree which are the the political parties so there's a there's a huge silent unarticulated majority of people who don't find a way to talk about power in the traditional ways and but who nevertheless are running their lives are being involved in charity work are running football clubs have have total intense cultural interests that they draw down from the digital realm there's like this absolute orchestra cacophony polyphony of stories out there that are not being not being told social media and the internet has allowed some of that to come through but it, that's a really interesting question about how these platforms for this pent-up mass self-expressivity and storytelling it's a real question to how we design these platforms we can design them in the toxic way that they are designed which is th which is to foment polarization between voices which which drives up clicks which sends you to advertisers which makes everybody money but toxifies the whole culture i think we're at the beginning of actually again thinking about how we design these interactions to so that people bring different values to them they, they bring different behaviors to them so that it's more like a storytelling culture than it is a, a polemical combative culture that's a that's a question for design now the design will change when it looks like people are gravitating in that direction and i think that i think that's this is the kind of interesting thing about the metaverse because i think it's in a it's it's a sort of realization from major tech companies that people might be disengaging from the kinds of um narrative and the kinds of feeling and sentiment that's coming through these social networks as divined as designed and they're almost trying to kind of throw another frame around an even bigger frame around it which is you know you're very experienced the things that you see in front of your eyes and ears uh, they're, they're almost moving in to try and get to that just in case people decide to unplug and do something else so it's a very interesting the metaverse is a very interesting moment i think it can be done badly again it could be done badly and it can be done civically and well but i think it's reacting to people's frustration that their full humanity is not coming through the media uh, and the structures and the technologies that are in front of them so back to your own point jeremy about the, about the the priority of the human i think that's actually being quite strongly asserted even at the very heart of um, the, the technology that we think like the matrix is completely swallowing and enveloping us i think there's an element of the human that's, that's pushing out against that yeah well that's the dark and the light that you're talking about because it'd be interesting to hear your view because on one hand you're saying well it's just another layer of reality a further dislocation from our natural self or is it an opportunity to project a more utopian and problem solve collaboratively en masse to create a prototype of, you know, where we can bring super minds together, all the right teams. You know, you know, one of the things that we're spending more time talking about is how do we bring the right minds together to solve the problems of the future? Because what you really need is a is a radically different model for making that happen. And I think we've, you know, in history there have been examples where you're bringing you know many different perspectives together but there are as as you as you say earlier exponentially different ways of doing that and it's not just with the different disciplines and the arts and sciences it is also with the centaurs in there but it's about bringing different voices who might currently be completely disenfranchised from this conversation into the mix and 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 i think that's for me i really don't have a very robust point of view on the metaverse but i'm certainly asking lots of questions at this stage about where it takes us i don't know how much thought that you've you've given it a lot of thought i mean one of the reasons why i'm happy to be speaking at the moment is is that i feel as if the culture that infuses things like um, a blockchain nfts crypto DAOs, metaverse game culture is is becoming a mainstream I mean, it's it's as if I I have a historical perspective on this, which is if I've had about forty years of gaming, 
And one would expect that to have a sociological consequence, a consequence on the, the mores and values and practices of a couple of generations now. And I think it is. I think people are, I think, I think particularly post the 2007-2008 crash, three months after of which Bitcoin is invented, after the, after the, 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 the fall of the major American financial institutions, you get Bitcoin saying, those rules are dead. We're going to make our own financial rules and we're going to play according to these circumstances. And, it's, and it's, that's, that's coming from generations of people using currency and, and video games. So I think, that there's a, I think there's a growing mainstream of playful and gameful sensibilities and consciousness that are deciding to go and make things because they have had an experience of being in a world of, of subjecting themselves to the rules of that world and have a literacy about making their own rules and creating their own worlds. So I think that's, I think that's burgeoning. And I, I also think it's really, really natural all the way from, all the way from Plato's cave. You probably, you probably remember that old story, but the idea that in Plato's cave, there are people who are looking into the cave uh, on with reflections on the wall that they mistake for reality. Um, and the, the whole idea of the metaphor is uh, Plato saying what, you know, turn back to reality, Plato says, I think the metaphor is we are in irredeemably imaginative creatures. And the thing is, who controls your imagination? Do you control your own imagination? Or do other people control your imagination? Or is there a way in which the imagineers can join together across across the boundaries and create new situations in which we can play fruitfully together? And it's and it's, and I th I'm, I'm quite adamant about this being a not an anti-consumerist, but a post-consumerist possibility. We really, it's all the climate science, all the IPC reports are telling us we have to get resources, we have to get resource use down. Um, if that pleasure of consumer capitalism is going to change, it has to change into something else because we're just going to get angry and frustrated and annoyed if we're unplugged from a consumer society that we were asked to be part of. I think the solution is Monbiot calls it public luxury, but I think it's playful coming together. So the idea that life can become more sociable, but also more festive and more participative and more joyful and creative. How do we construct those spaces? It's, that's not just the, the, the job of the public parks department. I think it's also the job of major parts of the existing corporate world who are serving to customers. I think we need to sort of come together to figure out how to get people down this crazy environmental slide uh, by by not going insane, and by in the, in the course of it building a new kind of public culture that isn't work obsessed, but it taps into uh, our, our evolved playful urges, and I think that might actually get us through this tough space that we're going through. Is if we think about ourselves as collectively playful uh, rather than collectively workful, I think that there, there needs to be a shift of the dial, and I, I, experiments need to be happening at all different levels. And I think there's definite experiments that can happen with business to help build this space, which will be a, a sanity and a calm-inducing space <laughs> rather than one that drives us uh, nuts. Again, it's back to our earlier point of how do we create those conditions. You know, what are the motivations? What are the incentives? And when I say incentives, those don't necessarily need to be financial. They should feature in there at some point. But, you know, what is our purpose? Well, that's that's sort of obvious when you look at the bigger picture. But when you get down to a, an individual, sometimes it's so, so complex, it's very difficult to understand where are we going with this and what am I actually signing up for and, and what am I going to get out of it? But I think that's the powerful role of, of creativity, because I think if you can begin to foster or almost resuscitate, if you like, the, the creativity that's almost been removed from us, as you say, that sort of the work ethic as opposed to the play ethic. And, you know, sometimes I think when it, this is going back, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was when I think it was Clay Shirky who talked about the cognitive surplus, where he talks about 24 hours in a day and there's eight hours of sleep and eight hours and we got this eight hours. That's, that eight hours of cognitive surplus has pretty much been soaked up with consumption of Netflix and, and social media. I mean, we know that it's, it's, it's pretty bonkers. And I think how can we sort of reclaim some of that time? You know, it is about 
development, but again, not necessarily professional de development. It's about having fun. It's about interacting with others. And so f so the, sometimes the way that we look at it is just some very basic building blocks. How do we just start by, you know, saying, even though you don't think you're creative, you probably are. Or, you know, and, and it's just, how do you start to legitimize play? How can you actually start to position it as a hugely valuable thing, both for intrinsically for an individual, but also for the economy as well? So when you say post-capitalist, but that creativity can create those can create those changes. And that's also where those ideas are going to come from. So if we can encourage the individual, when you start to think about the collective, if you had a collective of people who are more creative or more confident in their creativity, that's probably a better way of putting it. And and sort of a, a protocol, if you like, that allows them to communicate with one another, which gives some sort of structure to where they are in the journey and, and maybe the sort of the project or the idea that they want to develop and that could be a personal thing or it could be a purpose driven thing for a better planet it doesn't it doesn't really matter and i think it's about establishing those sorts of environments and creating those sorts of conditions and that's where it can be a very powerful thing and and i i came to that conclusion when i started looking at the social development goals from the un because i think they're about halfway into that program and it doesn't seem to be working and I think it doesn't seem to be working is because it's all been institutionalized. It's just like corporates are all over it. And it, it almost needs to happen on the outside. Those ideas need to be developed out there with people who care deeply about it and allow them to solve it in the way. And then they bring the ideas back. It's a little bit like those large organizations that set up, you know, ventures teams, but they can't really acquire businesses unless they are x million big because the antibodies of the culture destroy those ideas they can't report for them so how do you actually start to incubate those ideas or, or give them enough air you know enough oxygen to be developed before and stress tested and again this comes back to could the metaverse be used for that and i think that's the sort of uh, there's there's it, but it just needs to it it needs to be created outside i think of those formal institutions unless the conditions are right and and the conditions are set for that to happen um in a more powerful way really uh, i mean i think the metaverse can be a a, a beta verse i think it be i think it'd be the place where we can try out new forms of society new forms of economy so i think the metaverse can be a beta verse very easily and i think we i think there's an interesting collection of people who could make the argument for that to some degree regulators i think to some degree a kind of a corporate social responsibility uh, exercise on the part of the major corporations one of the ways i think we can land play is is really to pay attention to the psychology the biology and the neuroscience it, it really play in a human organism's life whether they're an adult or a child and we have to kind of talk about the forms of plays because because adult play is different from child's play but even if you talk about it in terms of art leisure and culture you know, there's a, a quotient of that a decent quotient of that in your life where you're active as well as passively consuming raises all your and all your organismic and physiological and neurophysiological indicators you become someone who has less inflammation who is healthier who is brighter who is able to respond there's lots and lots and lots of research that talks about a, a greater playful element which if you were a hard-nosed hr person you would want to be tapping into and i think i think that's the, the but the interesting thing to talk about play is that you're actually talking about mammalian a mammalian resource it's not just a human resource it goes deep and deep deep down so you have to find you have to be almost thinking of your 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 colleagues as flourishing complex animals as much as they are you know cognitive uh, role-playing role um, superior sapiens in, in refugee camps you know that things are improving when the kids start to play because they are, they are perceiving uh, or they are finding that there's an, an element of surplus, whether it's material surplus or cognitive surplus, in the space, and joy can begin to be expressed. They're the absolute canaries in the coal mine of when something is, is becoming better, when humans uh, as a community are beginning to flourish and, and get better. So I think, I think there's, a, there's a, a, a deep science, a deep human science explanation. I think there's a, a, a quite a hard-nosed explanation in terms of um, organisational performance. And I think, I think there's a huge thing from COVID. I, don't, I think we're, not, we're beginning to realise 
what actually happened there. So what's actually happened is that our distortion of the biosphere drove us away from our normal life, forced our governments to do things that they would never otherwise do, in induced new consuming patterns like, like Netflix. And I think there's a, there's a real mass philosophical moment has happened, which again is panning out in terms of the people changing, changing their jobs and deciding to stay, to stay at home. It's, it's an actual social, concrete economic phenomenon, the way that people are moving into worlds of self-determined meaning which is essentially what play is. It's you self-determining your own meaning. Play is connected to freedom. He who must play cannot play. That's the great philosopher James Carson's perspective. So to bring play into the discussion is to bring a very, very powerful element of, of natural life on this earth, of the way that organisms have for hundreds of millions, well, certainly for tens of millions of years anyway, found a way to break out of their niche. Play is the way that you waste energy in order to break out of your niche, whether that niche is surrounded by competitors or you're exhausting your resources. Play is the lubricant to move to a different a different part of the environment. Um, it, it looks as wasteful as sex, it's as wasteful as sleep, but it actually helps, it's helped the human being flourish uh, to the extent that we have and to the extent that we our, our play and our ingenuity has led us to the brink this is why i always go back to stuart brand the the great science communicator who was a, 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 a part of ken keyes's radicals in the late 60s and the whole earth catalog and, and you know the you know what i'm going to say which is that we are as gods and we might the original phrase is we are as gods and we might as well get good at it he revised that in 2005 i think to we are as gods and we better get good at it because we are responsible for the blue for the blue ball now we have to we have to raise our imagination and our practices to a certain level so to think about play in game i think is to think about human beings getting better at coping with their own dynamism because it's 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 undeniable we're either completely unnatural as creatures you know our dynamism self-terminates us or this part of our nature is what will balance the planet, take us to the stars, and keep us in a state of joy for as long as we're we're breathing. I think you know that's the stakes for me, Jeremy, and I'm happy to see it pass through you know, politics, economics, retail, advertising, technology, whatever. But but thinking about play makes you think about the power of humanity, both for good and ill, and the quality of our imaginations. And we have to we have to. We have to start raising that in an inexorable way. And certainly organisational innovation innovation in the way that um, people come together to do purposeful things in organisations is, is, is a big part of it. I think it could be the key part of it. Well, you mentioned the uh, Betaverse earlier. I was wondering if you've just coined that or that was one you already had up your sleeve. That's one I prepared earlier. But I think that may be a, a nice way. When I think about the Sense Network and how we encourage a lot of play in there. It is, you know, it absolutely is a space for bringing together, as we talked earlier, people who see things differently and think differently. And we celebrate that cognitive diversity and, and seek to really harness that for good. And the purpose of the network is to make things better and make better things for people, business and the planet. And so as we wrap up this conversation for today, because I think we're going to have to have another conversation very soon. There's there's so much more that we need to dig into. You know, as you think about what you're working on and, and new ideas that are coming through, is there anything that we could be doing with the Sense Network to, to support your sort of your, your future plans? Well, I, 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 I'm, as I say, I'm back on the question of how do we cope with our own creativity. And some, I do mean cope. I mean, uh, I, one of the things that I think is absolutely urgent, and I'm not, I'm not sure how to affect uh, it, but um, I think a lot about the media environment of the Russian citizen. That sounds like a real jump into somewhere land, but but it really, really concerns me the degree of media control that the current Russian government has over uh, the, the the Russian citizenry. There's there's a sort of sense in which I think we need to think about, uh, and I would put this out to your network, we need to think about the kinds of messages, um, the kind of soft power that can come from this side of the this side of the divide 
that can communicate with everyday Russian citizens. It's, it, there's a, this is a really the beginning of a, of a quite a complicated discussion about how you would get the messages, messages to them, how you get research from Russian society or what, what people are actually feeling. But there has to be a sense in which stories about insecurity, stories about past glories, stories about future glories uh, have to be fomented in people who need them. Um, and we've had a wee bit of that. Uh, a lot of my research recently has been looking at the psychological roots of political populism, the way that Project Fear and Project Anger and Project Sadness and Project Panic can just be pressed in the human condition. I think there are other buttons to be pressed, but I think some people really need to hear it more than others. And I would, I would just put that question out to your network. What's the kind of story about the world that we could communicate to a Russian citizenry? Could they hear it? And there might be a possibility for them to hear it, but it has to be better than the story that we've had, uh, you know, with the with the West vis-a-vis -vis Russia over the last 30, 40 years. There have been so many opportunities dropped. Yeah. But what would the stories be? What would the images be? What parts of human nature do we think are always going to be the same across any boundary and across any cultural story or any cultural particularity? And I think that's urgent. And I think creatives and imaginative people, you know, artists, novelists, software people, wireframe experts, VR experts, whatever, can really apply them. So that, to me, that feels like an application of playful imagination that is is urgent. And I, 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 would, love, I would love to hear some ideas on that. Well, as a follow-up, I, I think we should probably open this conversation up on the network and uh, get a get an open dialogue going in uh, a few weeks time and we can start to explore it. I think that would be that would be fantastic Pat. Love to. Well thank you so much I've thoroughly enjoyed that I hope. Me too. Anyone listening to it enjoys it too <laughs> and I'll look forward to the next time. All right sir power on. Thank you again Pat bye for now. Thank you for listening to Extreme Perspectives brought to you by Sense Worldwide. We'd love you to join this conversation using the hashtag Extreme Perspectives. If you enjoyed it, leave us a review. The Sense Network collaborates with many of the world's most innovative companies to help them be more innovative. Join us at thesensenetwork.com or get in touch via email hello at senseworldwide.com. <laughs>